I also wanted to just highlight one area that no one talks about, right? Which is we all focus on the strain, right? Making the strain as efficient as possible. Mm -hmm. There's a big component from the engineering standpoint. What, what do I mean by that? We have a process development group that then takes strains that are, you know, modified to do something different. And the process development team then figures out how to control the fermentations to get the most out of that strain. And then the second one is, how do you purify the molecule at commercial scale? Now, again, our process development team, you know, commercializing 12 different molecules, they've seen every problem that could be encountered in scaling up a yeah, molecule and purifying it. Right. Uh, yeah. And these are, you know, molecules are very different characters. Like some are liquids, some are semi-solids, some are solids, some are crystalline, some are amorphous. So, you know, they've had to solve for a lot of problems, even in the scale-up portion of the, of the, of the um, uh, a molecule. So it's not just in the lab that we had to innovate and figure out solutions. We also had to innovate on the large scale production side of the equation. Well, so so this is uh, again, and, and John, I apologize because we, we've spoken about this and, and I, I'm still amazed at how investors and, and the public in general are, are not really fully aware of synthetic biology and your capabilities, but about the enormous potential for what you can do. And, and I didn't really realize the extent of breadth of your knowledge of these different pathways. You said 20 different pathways that you've mastered already, which has kind of opened up the book of just about all molecules in nature. Um, and, and I'm also wondering, there's, there's a whole uh, bunch of man-made molecules out there or, and others even even different antibiotics, et cetera, that were designed because they're analogs of man-made or natural molecules. So I'm wondering if there's a, you know, a further upside for Amherst in, in that regard. Can you, can you produce eventually man-made molecules or even analogs of, of existing molecules? Look, I, I'd want to start uh, from a business strategy perspective, and then Sunil can talk about the technology. And from a business strategy perspective, we've made a clear decision that we believe the world needs more available and more accessible naturally occurring molecules. And so our focus is really to use our platform to make what, to make what already exists in nature, meaning we're not actually going into what I'll call basic research in discovering new chemistry. Uh, yeah. Now, where, where can we fit and do a great job? Somebody else can discover some new chemistry, but if they want to make it efficiently and they want to be able to scale it, they want to be able to make it available for everybody, I think we can come in and do that with no problem. It's just that we're not actually going into, right. you know, creating the new two-headed monster. It's not like our business. Our business is consumers are dying for natural, sustainably sourced chemistry and everything they consume. That is such a need right now that I think we could spend the next couple of decades doing that and still not be where we need to be in supplying the world's needs, right? And we're seeing okay. that across many industries. So, so where are we, uh, John and Sunil, in terms of uh, industry being aware of consumers' desire for natural sustainable products um, and, and also governments. I mean, the governments, it would certainly help to have some government support. Um, I, I do, I did note that DARPA somehow in the, in the past really helped Amaris, um, uh, you know, the a government agency. Um, but it, it, where is government in this and where is industry in this in terms of awareness? Yeah, the awareness is skyrocketed in the last 10 years. There's no doubt about that. And there's a reason for that. Um, you know, industry sees biology as a way to, to get the same molecule, okay, without sacrificing on cost or quality, right? Mm -hmm. And in many cases, a biological molecule will have higher, will have better performance than say a man-made chemical, okay? So I'll talk about, so industry is definitely heading this way. On right. the government side, the US government is seeing a huge benefit of a domestic biomanufacturing uh, pipeline set up over here, which is also why, you know, DARPA starting to fund a lot of projects in the synthetic biology space. Amaris has been recipient of, the, of some of those grants ourselves. Uh, so yeah, they are seeing potential for higher performance materials by relying on biological sources of chemicals. So 
you know, you talked about man-made chemicals. Polymer chemists, for example, are trying to find new polymers with improved performance. But the only way to make those polymers is using molecules that are made by biology and then using those biological molecules to create these brand new materials, you know, which could have improved performance you know, across the board in many different applications. Right. right. So, so how big do you see the uh, synthetic biology industry becoming? Um, you know, how many molecules uh, do you think will be produced by sort of fermentation approach and, 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 and what time period? I mean, in other words, how big could this industry become? Yeah, I mean, let's put it this way. Um, maybe instead of focusing on the number of molecules that we could make through fermentation, the way I would answer it is, how many applications will biology have some role to play in the future in terms of manufacturing, right? So maybe it's not the final molecule that, that is being produced by fermentation, but it's an intermediate that couldn't have been made any right. other way. So, you know, and to say that we can meet the current market for any chemicals would also be wrong because frankly speaking, biology can also help us expand that entire market because we're used to the chemicals we have today. But what if you had a better chemical tomorrow from biology, it suddenly explodes that market open. So right. you know, it, I feel biology can not just, you know, meet the current demands, but can actually expand our use of better molecules for better properties. John, anything so, else to add on that? Yeah. Yeah, look, I'll give you a couple of data points. Just in the last 48 hours, there have been two major acquisitions, uh, one by Crota and one by Simrise, of ingredient companies and natural ingredients to the fragrance industry. If that doesn't tell you, there is a, there is a market shifting dramatically in service of one thing and one thing only. Consumers are doubling down on sustainable, natural, and if you can't supply that as a consumer company, you're probably not gonna be around long term. So that's two major acquisitions, about $2 billion worth, and that is just a small slice of an industry called flavor and fragrance that is being disrupted dramatically by a hard shift to natural. We are, we are one of the major suppliers to the two biggest companies in that industry because of the quality of our natural sustainable ingredients, right? So I think of that as, and by the way, the total industry for flavors and fragrances is about $40 billion globally. So that's one extreme of very small industry shifting dramatically, pivoting to ensure that they can meet the demands of consumer brand companies that have to deliver natural for their consumers. On the other extreme, I mean, pick a big, pick a big chemical industry whether it's making rubber, whether it's making plastic, uh, or whether it's making uh, uh, something for the cosmetics industry. Any of those industries are multiple hundreds of billions of dollars, and they're all shifting the ingredients they're using to make more sustainable products. And I, I think right. in the U.S., especially with a new administration, we're going to see the U.S. go back to trying to catch up with China, who's moving and doubling down on sustainability in a big way. So how big can it be? It's hundreds of billions. And the question is, to Sunil's point, exactly which ingredients win. And a lot of that is, you know, where can biology add value to chemistry today? And that's changing like every day. Right. And I, one of the things I was hoping to touch on uh, today was, was cost, okay? It cost is a huge factor and will determine which markets you you go into and, and where you're successful. And, and I was hoping to understand from a science point of view in terms of your achievements, not only again in, in genetic strain engineering, um, uh, the, the manufacturing scale up process, um, how this pace of change seems to have accelerated in the last 10 years and how much further can you accelerate the pace of change so that you can reduce costs. And, and if, if you wanted to cite some examples, I had a few for you, but you know, you, you've, you've, the, both of you have talked about how you can deliver uh, costs from yeast fermentation at a, at a significantly cheaper cost than even naturally extracted molecules. And, and I, the, the numbers were astounding to me, you know, 20%, uh, you know, 80% cheaper cost or one, 20 times the production of monoclonal antibodies, 20 times the amount per hour 
versus the current Cho Chinese hamster ovary method. Uh, those are astounding numbers. How is it that that's possible? And can you improve on that in the next few years? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the cost of the, the investment needed to take any new molecule has dropped significantly at Amaris. And a lot of it is because we take the lessons learned from our previous projects and incorporate them into all our current projects. So whether they be HMOs, whether they be cannabinoids, vitamins, these are all molecules that we are currently working on and where we've seen a lot of success uh, in less than a year. And so within a year, we know exactly, you know, okay, how much more time is this going to take to go get up to manufacturing scale? Now, okay. the other point is at Amrus, we will, you know, have multiple iterations of manufacturing strain. So we might go to manufacturing today with strain one. And while that manufacturing process is going on, we're already working on the next generation for that same, of hmm. next generation strain for that same molecule. And so we are continuously improving and driving the cost of production down uh, continuously during that entire process. And that's happening now again with reduced investment in the R&D. Uh, so, so is there a rule of thumb, for example, of once you reach a, your first commercial strain, I assume that means that it's somewhat modestly profitable at least. And is there a rule of how much you can reduce the cost per, per kilogram? you know, eventually over the, 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 the evolution of the new strains and how many strains you can develop? Are we, are we talking about, okay, you can typically get two or three new strains and reduce the cost by X percent? Yeah, I mean, in any given year, yeah, we will actually uh, release anywhere from two to three new manufacturing strains for that same molecule. And really, the for the existing, this is for existing molecules, even yes. in the portfolio today. Yeah, it's it's only. Oh but let me let me let me clarify. That's typically for molecules that are within the first couple of years of introduction. Mm -hmm. I mean, all yeah. the molecules yeah. we have out that have been out for more than a couple of years, we're not currently developing or iterating the strains. It's really it's exactly the point you made, Graham. We yeah. we we in some cases will introduce a molecule that's marginally profitable. And then we yeah. really want to get to a target profitability. So in the first two years, you'll see a few iterations of that strain as we work down the cost curve. Yeah. Right. Okay. Because you did mention, John, if, if you if you want to touch on this, the Reb M. Uh, I, I I saw some reference to it being twenty percent of the cost of naturally sourced uh, Reb M sweetener. Uh, I, I didn't know when that was going to be. I, I I'm not sure if, if uh, Eduardo mentioned that. Somebody mentioned that. I think it was Eduardo. Um, how much, how, what is the cost today of what you're shipping today of RebM versus competitive sweeteners? And where, where is that target cost going to be with these new, new strains that Sunil was talking about? Yeah, so if you think about it, our, our cost of goods today to make RebM uh, on, on a production, on a cash cost production basis is actually lower than plant-based RebM. And that, 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 that to us is always a critical uh, initial criteria. Like if you're going to make it, you got to make it better than the plant source. Otherwise, what's the point? Plant-based plant is not the target. <laughs> the mm -hmm. target is okay. actually getting to uh, a significant uh, cost equivalency of sugar uh, because you're actually replacing sugar. And right. then secondly, uh, and by sugar, I'm talking about sugar cane or other sources of sugar. And then you right. want to be competitive with alternative or chemically sourced sweeteners. And we actually think that to get there is actually close to about a third of where we currently are on cost. And we think based on our strain pipeline and our integrated plan economics, we will be at that cost target by the end of 2021. So mm -hmm. if you think about it, that's a molecule we introduced uh, in, what was it? Uh, yeah, uh, 2000. 2018, 2018, right? Yeah. The end of 2018. And between the in, in the 2018 and end of 21, we're going to take the cost of that molecule down by three or four X. Wow. Okay. And and I just if, if, if really really appreciate having Sunil on this so I could ask you this question. Is there a physical wall or limit to this? Or are we this reduction in cost by, by tweaking the the strains further by by improving the manufacturing process, finding a new enzyme to you know or a new strand of DNA to then serve. Are, are, is there a kind of a wall or physical limit? I mean, I, 
I think the analogy is semiconductors. They kept saying there's a limit. They never reached a limit. Well, mm -hmm. they're sort of reaching it today, and then they're going three-dimensional. <laughs> so, so there was a limit in the 2D, you know, uh, uh, lithography and that kind of thing, uh, of printing circuits on a chip. But so they're now going three-dimensional. So there's always ways to improve. Are there, are there limits that you see in terms of physics, physical limits, or even biology or chemistry that would say, okay, we are asymptotically going to be slowing down after, you know, five iterations or after we reduce the cost by 20%, 50% or 80%, you know, how, how much headroom do you have? Yeah, for each, so for each molecule, there is a theoretical limit to how low you can go in cost. And that theoretical okay. limit is entirely biological, right? Biology yeah. can convert X amount of the sugar you're feeding to make Y amount of the molecule. And that okay. is not, uh, you know, you can tweak that a little, but you can't go beyond a certain uh, cost on that one. Uh, okay. Okay. Now, but there is the other question, which is how fast can you take a molecule to market? And there, I would say that, you know, you can probably be as quick as uh, it takes to make a strain grow because you can't, now again, you can't go faster than the amount of time it takes to take a strain grow. But Theoretically, we, we're not anywhere close to where we could be in taking a molecule to market as quickly as possible. Uh, are we, you know, we are definitely better than everyone else out there, but, you know, on that front, I would say there are, there's a lot of potential. Uh, it, it's, it's almost like, if you, if you think about that, like the, the real perfect model would be, you know, within two months or less of target, you're actually making it at scale. And that would really redefine the world of chemistry because if you think about chemistry you know developing a new catalyst or building a new chemical plant that takes a long time so imagine if all of a sudden biology was really not only your cheapest but your fastest and most sustainable way to make new chemistry uh, and i yeah. think that absolutely has potential i think the other is really about the theoretical max conversion of carbon inside of a pathway and there is a theoretical max uh, for all that carbon that you can move through an organism to make the chemistry you want. And mm -hmm. as Sunil said, uh, you know, every one of those is different based on the actual molecule. What's the chemistry you're making and what's the theoretical max flux that you can move carbon through an organism? Right. Yeah. Right. I think for if, me, yeah. the vision would be irrespective of the molecule you're going after. The vision is, you know, one design, one strain, and you're done. Right. I mean, at, at some oh, okay. point, our understanding of biology and our pipeline needs to be there. One design, one strain, commercial scale manufacturing. Are we there yet? No, but we are definitely aiming for that. Wow. That would reduce the cost of development and would speed speed up time to market. Um, and I, I, I was wondering if you could tie, I'm not sure how much time we have, but if, if you could tie this in with monoclonal antibodies, which uh, to me, is an astoundingly large potential market of very, very high value. I mean, we seeing we're seeing with COVID, of course, the the importance of science and 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 and, and achieving uh, some solutions as fast as possible. So, time to market is important. And I'm wondering, I'm sorry to ask such a long question, but I'm wondering why has it taken um, the pharmaceutical industry so long to understand that maybe fermentation yeast fermentation is a solution. Uh, how is it that a, that a small company like Amaris is able to provide a solution and file patents for it just in August to, to reduce uh, capital costs by, to, to one sixth of the capital cost and, and have 10 to 20 times the productivity? In other words, to me, you know, 10% of the cost. How, how is it that a small company like Amaris could do this? And why is it taking the pharmaceutical industry so long to understand this? So antibodies are a, a different class of molecules and they have very special requirements in terms of their structure. And so to, to date, most companies end up using what we call Chinese hamster ovary cells, Cho cells. And there's a reason for that, that Cho cells have the ability to engineer antibodies the way we need them to be. But in the last 10 years, you know, again, I've talked about how we have learned more and more on how to engineer yeast and incorporate new metabolic networks into yeast. And that is what our technology enables us to do, which is take the same machinery that currently exists in say Cho cells that allows you to finally tailor antibodies and use that and import that same machinery 
into an organism like yeast. And so, and, and, and those tools didn't exist before. And at Amaro, so, we so you, so yeah, you, you actually are using some of the machinery that is involved in the Cho cells and, and inserting it in the yeast fermentation process? Yeah, you'll end up having to apply some new functionality. So what I'm talking about is, you know, there's some functionality that happens that exists in Cho cells, which you need to now incorporate into yeast. So yeast can then carry out the same reactions that occur in Cho cells when antibodies are being made, for example. So an example could be glycosylation patterns. So antibodies yes. have, you know, a very interesting array of sugars on their, you know, on the on, on the protein. How do you recapitulate that in yeast? So that's the challenge. But over the last five years, at least at Amherst, we've learned a lot on how to, uh, you know, uh, perform that biology in yeast itself. Is is that are those learnings patentable? And does this mean that? as Amherst does begin to get proof of concept and then actual orders to perhaps produce monoclonal antibodies for some of these new pharma drugs are, are, that, that you could have a, a, a semi-monopoly in, in being able to manufacture in this, in this way? Yeah, I mean, we will, of course, you know, make sure we protect our technology platform for producing antibodies. There's no doubt about that. And at the end of the day, what our goal is that any new antibody that's discovered, we should be able to produce that in a matter of months as opposed to years. And not and 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 the cost should not be that only the rich people can afford to do uh, to uh, access these antibodies, but should be available for everyone. And so that's what a yeast platform enables us to do, which is you know discovery of antibody to commercial scale manufacturing of antibody cost effectively is a matter of months. I think so that's if you make I, yeah, if you're able to make one monoclonal antibody for a pharmaceutical company. Does this mean that you can make others, all the others or some of the others or a few of the others? What, what, what proportion of future monoclonals could you be able to produce through yeast? Is this, is this a, a universal process? It is a, you know, the platform that we are working on right now is going to be a universal solution towards wow. antibody production in yeast. Wow. Yes. So, so John, what, what, what's, uh, what's with pharma here? Why is it taking them so long? <laughs> well, the last time I checked, most of the major innovations that pharma markets don't actually come from big pharma. So I actually huh. think that what we're doing is exactly how pharma was designed. And, you know, being on the board of bio globally, I actually sit alongside the leaders of most of these pharma companies. And it is actually a business model they move to, right? They move to this business model of outsourcing innovation to startups and then yeah. monitoring that innovation and picking it up uh, and trying yeah. to uh, adopt when it's ready. And I think, yeah. uh, I think the opportunity here is, is exactly that. So look, I think we're, uh, we're running uh, out of time and I really wanna yeah. just take a few minutes to say, thank you for trying to make uh, really a revolution in making chemistry sustainable, uh, understandable, because it's not easy when yeah. Yeah. an industry is in transition and it's not easy, especially when it involves as many disciplines from fermentation to biology to chemistry to make it understandable. And I appreciate the effort because it takes a tremendous amount of time and effort. And you, more than any other analyst we work with, has absolutely done that. And so that is a, that is a benefit to society. And I think many companies can learn a lot from, uh, from what you're trying to get out there. So I appreciate it, Grant. That's great. Well, thank you very much. This is really exciting. Thanks. Thank you, Graham. Yeah, this is, you, this is a lot of fun. Thank you so much. This is great. Thank you. Good luck. Take care. Yeah, thank Bye. you. Bye.